Your Excellency, Mrs. Lee, Ambassador Chan, Consul Generals, distinguished guests, faculty, students, ladies and gentlemen. Senior Minister Lee Kuan Yew's speech today follows presentations we have hosted during the past several weeks at the Baker Institute, focusing on the important role that culture plays in economic and social change in Asia. These talks are focused on how foreign corporations influence Chinese society through their values and culture, and about the relationship between Asian values and the economic crisis in Asia. These sessions are just a part of a major initiative by the Baker Institute's Transnational China Project to open up research and discussion on the ways that the radical economic changes in Asia are interacting with Chinese culture and values. Next March, we will be hosting a, a path-breaking major research conference bringing together scholars from the PRC, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and the United States to find new ways to study the cultural foundations of property rights in Chinese societies. Rice's faculty is very much involved in this. We have Professor, uh, Professor Ben Lee here. We have Rich Smith, who just won, won uh, the, uh, was named Texas Professor of the Year, I'm proud to say, and uh, Steve Lewis, our project coordinator, who are leading this effort. In future years, the Transnational China Project will continue to form new networks of scholars and practitioners studying these issues, and we look forward to bringing them to Houston to share their expertise with you. It is now my great pleasure to turn the podium over to one of our country's most noted statesmen, the Honorable James A. Baker III, the former Secretary of State and Treasury, and most importantly, the Honorary Chair of the Baker Institute, who will introduce our very special guest and distinguished speaker. Welcome, Secretary Baker. Thank you very much, uh, Ed. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my rare privilege uh, today and distinct honor to introduce <clears throat> to you that rare individual who, during this era of relentless hype, truly, I think, deserves to be called a living legend. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew is quite literally the father of his country, first ushering Singapore into independence, and then over the course of 30 years providing the leadership that raised it from a remote colonial outpost to one of the most emulated societies in the world today. He is also <clears throat> the creator of a model, a free market model of educated workers and energetic entrepreneurs, criticized by many for years, but ultimately triumphant. And today the standard by which countries around the world judge their own performance and indeed even that of their neighbors. He is also the voice of an entire region, principled, articulate, fearless in the face of controversy, who has been eloquent not just in promoting Asia's new role on the world stage, but also, as Ed Dirigian just said, in defending its traditional values. Finally, and very importantly, at least to me when I was Secretary of State, he is a trusted ally of the United States who has stood with us not just when times were good, but most notably during the Vietnam War when times were very, very dark indeed. And that, I think, is the final and best test of true friendship. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great deal of pride and it gives me real personal pleasure to welcome to the Baker Institute an individual who can lay a legitimate claim to being the world's senior statesman, the senior minister of Singapore, the Honorable Lee Kuan Yew. The Honorable Mr. James Baker, uh, Ambassador Darijian, ladies and gentlemen, I had read of Houston. It was a faraway place. I never knew that I would find myself in Houston speaking at the Baker Institute. But as part of this ever-shrinking world, I first came across Texans when they came out to Singapore as oilmen looking for oil wells in the 1960s, and they based themselves in Singapore. 
<coughs> then they started building oil rigs in Singapore rather than towing them out from Houston. Then they brought in compact Texas instruments and a whole new relationship opened up and you're one of our most important trading partners, the state of Texas. I have had the privilege and the honor of knowing your distinguished Secretary of State since 1980 when he was President Reagan's Chief of Staff and then <coughs> Secretary of the Treasury and then Secretary of State. I'm very pleased, privileged and honored to be invited to speak at his institute. I've chosen as my subject what something very topical, and I hope to give it a slightly different slant or slightly different approach it from a slightly different angle from that which you have read about in the press. In the press, you have heard how bribery, corruption, collusion, nepotism has brought this about. Yes, it has. It's contributed to aggravating the damage. But this afternoon, I would like to take you to the other side of the coin, so to speak, from the victim's point of view. They may be right, they may be wrong, but this is what they felt happened to them. And they are both the same side, two, the same, two same sides of the coin. Now, more than a year after the Asian currency crisis started in July last year, the world economy has become very fragile. East Asia, including Japan, is in recession. And Latin America, especially Brazil, appears headed for a major economic slowdown, if not a recession. The US economy, which is already in its seventh year of economic expansion, that has been sustained by high consumer spending and high consumer confidence, is now susceptible to a major downturn in the stock market. Europe continues to grow, but its recovery has been export-based, whilst domestic, domestic spending continues to be hobbled by high unemployment rates. All over the world, nervous investors are running for cover and moving out of risky assets into treasury bonds. Some are even thinking of moving out from treasury bonds into cash. With the collapse of the Russian ruble in mid-August, the financial crisis has now infected all emerging markets. Spreads on emerging market bonds have risen to stratospheric levels. And Latin America is desperately trying to fend off a run on its economies. Unless Brazil is helped from its present predicament, a financial collapse in Latin America, not unlike that that has happened in East Asia, may well be on the cards. Even the mature markets of the United States and Europe have not been spared this flight to quality. Only a few years ago, these same investors, or rather the fund managers who manage the monies of these investors, especially from the G7 countries, were bullish on East Asia. And their optimism was not unfounded. East Asia's fundamentals were strong, high growth, low inflation, budgets in balance or in surplus, high savings rate, high investment rates. Compared to the G7 home markets where interest rates had fallen, as inflationary pressure subsided, East Asia offered high returns or higher returns on capital. Since the middle 1980s, East Asia has be benefited from Japanese capital flowing into the region in search of low cost production bases. It all started with the Plaza Accord in which Secretary Baker was a leading figure that forced the Japanese yen up and as the yen became expensive, 
the Japanese relocated their factories into East Asia. And that started the East Asian, that spread the East Asian medical from just Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore to the rest of the region. The rising tide of Japanese foreign direct investments have lifted the economies of the whole region. It created manufacturing jobs, upgraded technology, enhanced productive capacity, and opened up export markets for East Asia. East Asia's positive experience with foreign capital inflows whetted the appetite for more. By the early 1990s, information technology and financial innovation and liberalization were bringing in a different type of capital into East Asia. G7 international banks and institutional investors poured into Asia in search of higher returns because their own economies were in recession. G7 capital flows into emerging markets increased fivefold, fivefold, from 40 billion US dollars in 1990 to over 200 billion in 1996, fivefold. Asia absorbed almost half of these net private inflows from 1994 to 1996. With hindsight, East Asia should have been or should have taken measures to fend off and control these massive capital inflows. After all, their own domestic savings were high enough to finance most of their investment needs. Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Korea had savings rates averaging more than 30% of GDP in the 1990s, much higher than the 18% in Latin America. All they needed was to supplement their considerable savings with foreign direct investments, which could bring technology, management expertise, and export to markets. They did not need any portfolio investments. Moreover, East Asia was already running at or near full capacity. Growing current account deficits in the mid-1990s and declining unemployment rates were clear signs of overheating. They did not need the extra boost from large short-term capital inflows. When they need, what they needed was the opposite, to slow down and cool their economies while they built up their productive capacity and strengthen their institutional framework to manage the pro problems of integrating with the global financial market. Unfortunately, they were encouraged by multinational, multilateral institutions like WTO, World Trade Organization, the IMF, the World Bank, and the finance ministers of the G7 countries to open up their capital accounts and liberalize their financial systems in order, as they were told, to reap the full benefits from a globally efficient allocation of capital. These countries had foreign exchange controls. In other words, no open capital accounts. They had weak banking systems, poor banking supervisions, they had unorthodox practices, but they were making six, eight, ten percent growth, probably two or three percent wasted as a result of unorthodox methods of doing business, but still making those high rates of growth. Now, analysts from these international institutions and rating agencies, both the US and EU, assured them that the strong macroeconomic fundamentals meant negligible risk from further liberalization of their capital accounts. On their side, these countries found the prospect of easy access to cheap foreign funds irresistible. So between 1990 and 1994, first Thailand undertook three rounds of foreign exchange control liberalization. 
essentially removing most controls on capital inflows, leaving some restrictions on outflows. They had a Bangkok International Banking Facility established originally to promote Bangkok as an offshore banking center. Instead, it became a channel for offshore funds into Thailand, which led to their undoing. Indonesia had opened up its capital account in the early 1970s when the international capital markets were not as sophisticated. But it was only in the 1990s <clears throat> that domestic corporations and banks began tapping international capital markets in a big way, and they removed their foreign exchange controls. Because there are no foreign exchange controls, Indonesian authorities had not set up any system of monitoring capital inflows. Nobody knew that their corporations had run up so much short-term capital debt, 90 billion US dollars. It was the same story in Thailand. By 1997, both Thailand and Indonesia had more short-term external debt than they had in foreign reserves. Now, Korea had a more nationalistic industrial policy, maintaining tight capital control right up to the 1990s. It came under international pressure to liberalize. It also wanted to become a full graduate member of the developed world to join the OECD. And as part of the qualification for joining the OECD in 1996, it accelerated the liberalization of its capital account and ironically, Korea eased controls on short-term capital to permit external borrowing by Korean banks, including greater access to credit, trade credit, but kept controls on medium and long-term capital to protect these industries. It did exactly the wrong thing, allowed short-term capital in and blocked long-term investments on the industries out. And this made for a rapid buildup of short-term external bank debt leading to the November 1997 crisis. Domestic corporations in Thailand, Indonesia, and Korea borrowed from abroad because interest rates on the US dollar were much lower than their own domestic interest rates. This led to a massive increase in external debt. Many of these companies made the fundamental mistake of borrowing short-term for long-term projects. They could not have done so with such impunity if their capital accounts had not been open. Their governments also did not appreciate the moral hazard problem of pegging their exchange rates when they no longer had restriction on capital flows. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the financial markets, may I say, Moral hazard means that when a government, in this case, when a government has more or less by practice pegged its exchange rate to the US dollar for several years, it led its entrepreneurs, its corporates, managers to believe that that is the rate at which they can borrow and they will later be able to repay. And that was when the trouble started because when they had to repay, that wasn't the exchange rate. This led their private corporations to believe the stable exchange rates were in their governments, were their governments guarantee that there would be no currency exchange risk. So they borrowed in US dollars, assuming that exchange rates would remain more or less the same when the time for repayment came. As a result, they did not hedge their foreign exchange exposure. Funds in international capital markets were deceptively cheap, only because the true risks were not fully priced in. If these countries had floating exchange rates, borrowers would have been more aware of the risk they carried of a possible depreciation against the benefit of lower interest rates. And foreign lenders would not have been so confident 
the borrower could repay if exchange rates were subject to sudden collapse. Thailand, Indonesia, and other East Asian countries would have been better off if their capital accounts had been liberalized more gradually. In tandem with the strength of their financial systems and institutional capability. At a minimum, they needed a system to monitor, to check, and control the flow of short-term speculative funds, and to ensure that the maturity of the debts and investments were properly matched. As it was, large amounts of short-term funds flowed in to finance long-term investments. A significant proportion went into asset markets, stocks and properties, office blocks and condominiums, because they were already overinvested. These stocks and properties were in turn used as collateral for borrowing, further inflating the asset bubble. It is widely accepted that free trade in goods and services where countries specialize in producing what they have comparative advantage in and gain by trading what they produce beyond their needs produces efficiency gains. And G7 countries were right to advocate trade liberalization. G7 countries, I believe, in retrospect, <coughs> should have been more cautious in pressing for more liberalized financial markets and free capital movements. There is an ongoing dispute amongst financial experts whether free capital mobility is an unalloyed good. There are inherent dangers in today's globalized financial markets when massive amounts can flow in and out at the touch of a computer button. In fact, the chief economist of the World Bank, Joseph Tiglitz, had warned before these financial markets were opened up that the developing countries would be disadvantaged by such rapid inflows and outflows of capital. The debate is still on. Capital account liberalization should have been more carefully calibrated according to the level of soundness and sophistication of each country's financial system. Countries that are not ready for the risk should have installed circuit breakers, controls to cope with any sudden inflow or outflow of funds. Chile, for example, imposes a tax on foreign borrowing and requires portfolio investors to put a portion of their funds in non-interest bearing deposits with the central bank to discourage short-term inflows. Of course, controls restricting capital mobility will increase the cost of capital, and growth may be slower. But for the countries that have been affected, that growth would have been much more stable and sustainable. Therefore, are capital controls the way out for East Asia? You have all heard of Paul Krugman of the MIT. Uh, he has argued that Plan A, IMF orthodoxy, high interest rates, austerity in monetary and fiscal policies, have failed in East Asia. And he has suggested that it was time to try Plan B, capital controls. With controls, an economy could plug capital outflows that result from a loss of confidence while pursuing expansionary monetary policies like cutting interest rates without hurting its currency. He published this in Fortune and the day after, the Prime Minister of Malaysia, Dr. Mahathir, implemented Plan B. Paul Krugman was prompt to write an open letter to the Prime Minister to say that his scheme will only work 
if four important criteria are observed, and he spelled them out. <laughs> he had his academic reputation now at stake. Uh, on the 1st of September 1998, Malaysia imposed capital controls. The Malaysian ringgit deposits held offshore must be repatriated within a month or become worthless. Foreigners who sell Malaysian shares cannot take out the proceeds for a year. Malaysian exports and imports must be settled in foreign currency. The Malaysian ringgit was fixed at 3.8 to the dollar a 10% premium to the traded rate before controls. Malaysia's capital controls can offer a temporary window of opportunity to stimulate and reform its economy. The government has sharply lowered interest rates, reduced bank reserve requirements, and instructed banks to maintain their lending growth at 8%. However, excessive expansion in domestic demand could lead to a deterioration of their trade balance, a loss of foreign reserves, and capital flight. Capital controls provide the opportunity to carry out banking reform and corporate restructuring without the pressures of a volatile currency that has to be propped up by high interest rates. Again, I repeat, experts are not in agreement about the merits of capital control and a growing view is that regulations over short-term capital flows can be useful in shielding developing countries against the volatility of capital flows in today's globalized financial market. However, comprehensive controls are administratively cumbersome and can lead to corruption. And they can induce a false sense of security and result in loose economic policy and weak financial discipline. Open economies like Singapore cannot afford to consider capital controls. It will irrevocably damage our reputation as an international banking center. No country in the region, however, can insulate itself from the effects of the financial turmoil. Singapore has suffered from the fallout. Tourism from Korea, Japan, Southeast Asia has declined, and our exports and imports with the region has fallen. But we have escaped the brunt of the crisis because we have maintained tight macroeconomic discipline and constant vigilance over our banking system. As a result, our interest rates were lower than US dollar interest rates, and Singapore companies had little reason to borrow in US dollars. Our banks were strong and well supervised. But nevertheless, Moody's, SNP's, Fitch, IBCA has downgraded them from three A's to two A's because they are exposed both in Indonesia and Malaysia to a tune of some 30 to 40 billion dollars. Thus, although our financial system is better protected than our neighbors, and have enabled us to weather the crisis better, we have not been able to get away unscathed. Question now is what can be done? The crisis has caused heavy losses to investors, but what was a tragedy for the countries was really the devastation that it has caused to the lives of their people. It has wiped out years of growth and development in Indonesia and the affected countries, although Indonesia is the worst off. The Indonesian rupiah today is worth only about 20% of its value. Probably if I go by yesterday's quote, it's now worth about 25% because since the US Fed lowered interest rates by 25 basis points, all the currencies in the region have risen including the rupiah. So if the US interest rates trend downwards, then our recovery may well be made easier. In time, investor confidence should return 
what we saw in East Asia in the past 30 years was not a mirage. Strong growth in the export industries has transformed what was formerly agricultural societies into industrial societies. The East Asian values of hard work, sacrifice for the future, respect for education and learning, and an entrepreneurial spirit, they are the underlying strengths which will see these countries through their crisis and help them regain their former dynamism. In these decades of development, these countries have acquired the infrastructure, the technology, the management skills that will survive the crisis. The rankings of East Asian countries in international surveys of economic competitiveness have dropped, as they must. But they remain ahead of their other developing regions and transitional economies. For example, 1998 World Competitiveness Yearbook by IMD in Lausanne puts Singapore, Hong Kong, and Taiwan still within the top 10 countries in the world where, if I can quote them, enterprises are managed in an innovative, profitable, and responsible manner. The crisis has shown East Asia's areas of improvement, but the development base built up in the last three decades are still in place and will help a speedy recovery once the new conditions are favorable. The pace of recovery will depend on the way individual countries reform their economies. For those under IMF programs, international investors will be watching closely for their compliance with IMF prescriptions. The IMF may have made some mistakes through, a, through lack of experience with the type of problems faced by East Asia because their experience has been Latin America. It has been learning. The IMF has been modifying its prescriptions. In any case, IMF endorsement of the economic programs of a distressed country is essential to restore investor confidence. With or without IMF help, these countries will have to build up their financial system and the supporting legal framework. Banks will have to be recapitalized, some merged into stronger entities and sold to foreigners, others allowed to go bankrupt. A strong regulatory and supervisory regime has to be established and proper systems of credit assessments and loan provisioning put in place. Institutional weaknesses masked in times of high growth will now have to be put right. Insolvency laws drafted for a different age and rarely used have proved inadequate to protect creditors. Indonesia and Thailand have passed new bankruptcy laws and they now have to follow through with the implementation. Transparency in corporate accounts and the protection of minority shareholders, which were ignored when share prices were rising, have now become issues of importance. In today's high-risk environment, greater transparency will prove critical in convincing investors, both domestic and foreign, to buy a stake in a local company. As, so long as these structural reforms are in place, these crisis-stricken countries will be able to cope with the social and political consequences of the deepening economic crisis. Unemployment is rising, companies are falling under the burden of high debt and poor business conditions. They need to turn their economies around and they cannot do so without foreign assistance. Hence, the US, Japan, and the EU can and must play their part in facilitating the recovery of the affected economies. But as long as Japan, Asia's largest economy, remains depressed, the whole region will be hobbled. Since 1986, Japan has been the prime mover of the industrialization of the region. <clears throat> 
It absorbs 12% of East Asia's exports and has been the largest source of direct investments in nearly every country in East Asia since the Plaza Accord in 1985. To be fair, Japan has also been generous in response to the Asian crisis. It has carried the biggest share of the IMF rescue packages in Korea, Indonesia, and Thailand, and they have been forthcoming with humanitarian aid. Japan has also announced during the IMF meeting in Washington this September of a new initiative of 30 billion US dollars to help the affected countries of East Asia raise funds in the international capital market. But the best contribution Japan can make is to get its own economy moving again. It is the export powerhouse of Asia and a net creditor nation. Japan's financial problems, the bad debts of its banking sector, were not the result of excessive borrowing from abroad. They were homemade. With political will, it can cut the knot of domestic bad debt and begin its recovery. Finally, the role of the US. The United States has a strategic stake in East Asia's recovery. US exports more to East Asia, including Japan, than it does to Europe. In 1997, exports to East Asia accounted for 28% of total U.S. exports. The West Coast states of California, Washington, and Oregon sell more than half of their exports to Asia. Among the 50 states, Texas is the fourth largest exporter to Asia. Texas' principal sectors that export to Asia include chemicals, electronics, industrial machinery, and computers. Beyond this commercial interest, however, the U.S. has worked hard to craft and establish the present world economic order based on free market principles. The U.S. must take the lead in managing this crisis. Charles Kindleberger, in his History of the Great Depression, published in 1973, pointed to a leadership crisis in the industrial nations as the main cause of the economic depression. The First World War had produced a power shift from Britain to the United States. Because the United States was unwilling to assume responsibility for stabilizing the world economy, there was a leadership vacuum. In the 1930s, Kindleberger quote noted, every country when every country turned to protect the national private interests, the world public interest went down the drain, and with it, the private interests of all. That lesson should never be forgotten. The world has come a long way from the protectionist responses, like the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act of 1930, which worsened the Great Depression. Working with the IMF, the U.S. has played the key role in responding to crisis-stricken Asian countries. But the United States cannot stop here. President Clinton has recently said that the financial crisis is the biggest challenge to the world economy in the last 50 years. I believe he is right. In the coming months, the United States must have to take a strong leadership and work with the other major countries in Europe and Japan to address the immediate problems thrown up by this crisis. The crisis has raised fundamental and complex issues about the architecture of the global financial system. The United States will also need to provide enlightened intellectual leadership to address these issues. Allow me to conclude by saying that it would be short-sighted and potentially disastrous for the United States and the world if it were to neglect the troubled countries of East Asia and does not stay engaged to provide the focus and the leadership 
of an East Asian financial crisis that has gone global but must now be resolved globally. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Senior Minister. Uh, we have uh, many, many questions and not enough time to answer all of them, but I'll try to categorize them. Uh, one set of uh, questions, Your Excellency, is do you see the world <clears throat> moving from a unicurrency based on the dollar system to a multi-currency one to prevent similar meltdown in the future? If so, which currencies would you back? <laughs> uh, I don't think the meltdown is caused because it, most of the reserves of the central banks of other countries is in the U.S. dollar. I think the meltdown is because countries opened up their capital accounts before they were prepared to handle the sudden inflows and outflows of capital. But to answer the question whether or not the euro will cause more stability or instability, I would say the question is still too early to answer. Uh, it could well be that the euro, in spite of all the skeptics of uh, 11 countries with marching to 11 drummers suddenly having to march to one drummer, whether they can keep in step. But the political will uh, should not be underrated. It could well be that some of the lesser countries may not be able to keep up, but I think the core countries, Germany, France, Benelux, maybe even Italy, they are determined for political reasons to stay together. Now, if they do and they can maintain the euro as a stable currency, then I believe in five years, many of the reserves of foreign central banks will move and diversify probably one-third to the euro, and if uh, it still continues to grow and solidify itself in the market after 10 years, maybe it could become equal to the dollar. But that's something very much in the future. Mr. Minister, with the uh, potential backlash against free market capitalism by the pop populace of <coughs> populations, uh, and against international interventionism, can Asian markets possibly continue to move towards more open free market standards or full financial disclosure and currency flows? Well, we are at a very interesting stage. I've described to you in very rounded and bland terms what is now an acute uh, comparison between two systems, one IMF based orthodoxy being amended to meet the needs of East Asia, which is somewhat different from Latin America, and uh, the unorthodox, or even as uh, Dr. Mahadir, Mahadir himself has said, the heretical view. He's closed his market, he's going to do it and solve it his own way. <clears throat> now, if at the end of another two years, Thailand and Korea is doing worse than Malaysia, and Malaysia has shown that it can in fact shut the world off, control its internal economy and grow, then I think there's going to be a fundamental rethinking of the paradigm as to how to grow and how to plug into this global economic network. Uh, I tend to be more orthodox in my approach. I think there are already signs that uh, 
the Korean one and the Thai baht, especially in this last few days after the 15th of October when the Fed <coughs> reduced interest rates by 25 basis points, uh, these currencies are stabilizing. The interest rates are growing, are grow, are growing down, the currencies have strengthened, and uh, the Malaysian ringgit is pegged at 380, which was decided by the government. So one is strengthening, the other is staying put by administrative decree. I have a feeling if the Fed keeps on lowering interest rates, as it's not unlikely to keep up uh, <clears throat> or to prevent this uh, slowdown in the U.S. economy, then I think Thailand and Korea may do better, in which case orthodoxy will prevail and capital markets will continue to be open, but this time with the Korea and Thailand much better equipped to handle these inflows. Uh, I'd like to explain this. I think in the first phase, uh, the spotlight was on corruption, collusion, cronyism, bribery, and the rest of it. Yes, it's been going on for 30 years, but they made growth. Didn't bring the country down. What brought it down was foreign debt, which they didn't have when the capital account was closed. But once there was this debt and it couldn't be repaid, then all the financial analysts drew up this uh, laundry list of all the evils of the system. And the IMF went in. I'm told there's now a debate. Well, not I'm told. I've been reading about the debate between <coughs> two groups. You've read Henry Kissinger and uh, a few others who are the hard-headed ones and says <clears throat> that the IMF's job was not to interfere in the internal uh, structures of this country, just to put what was wrong short-term, gone wrong short-term credits, to try and bridge them over. But in the real world with your press, your media as it is, and uh, uh, Congress reading the media and being influenced by it, and they read the President Suharto and his family with $42 billion stashed away. <laughs> the tendency was, well, uh, let them fix it, bring the $42 billion back. But in fact, as different from President Marcos, the Suharto family had most of their $42 billion in, in enterprises in Indonesia. They didn't put their money outside, and they are still in Indonesia. And there's going to be some nasty wrangling as to who owns what and why, who should pay up for what was not lawfully obtained and so on. But the fact remained that they generated and drove this economy forward. I'm not, uh, going to, I'm not wanting to defend uh, unorthodox ways of doing business, but I. I believe it was a tragedy. And uh, a, a regime that worked, but perhaps had, was in need of restructuring or revision or updating, was brought down in this catastrophic way, just by financial instability, by the money market. And 30 years of stability, growth, just went down the drain in 30 weeks. I feel particularly aggrieved that they have destroyed, in an impersonal way, a government that brought Indonesia 30 years of relative stability and rescued it from poverty, and brought peace and stability to the region, and allowed all the region to grow in tandem. Now we're in for exciting times. <laughs> Along these lines, uh, Your Excellency, that we have several questions on the interaction of economics and human rights, but one pertinent question, how has the liquidity of capital investment in flight affected human rights and sustainable development in Asia? <laughs> 
Uh, I had this question put to me by <coughs> Miss Sydney Jones, Human Rights Watch in, in New York. <laughs> and I was speaking. I don't think this is her question. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I'm not. I'm not uh, saying that you're, you're putting this to to put mm. me uh, against the wall because I I feel quite comfortable <laughs> with my human rights record. <laughs> uh, she asked me whether it wasn't a good thing. And I thought I should be honest with her. That uh, I thought it was a major tragedy. Uh, in the elusive pursuit of this $42 billion, they have destroyed an economy which was about $250 billion a year, or GDP, and have now created 100 million people living below the poverty line, unable to buy their rice and their basic necessities. So we're talking about human rights, not about the demonstrators uh, who vociferously proclaim their liberty to do this, that, and the other, but the basic right to survival and to meet the daily needs of your self and your family, uh, a real grievous harm has been done. And uh, humanitarian aid can help, but you can't feed 100 million people every day for the next five to 10 years. No country can do that. Mr. Minister, we have several questions on the situation in Malaysia. Uh, please give us your observations on the imprisonment of Mr. Anwar Ibrahim in Malaysia and what it says about the succession problems of democracy in Malaysia. Well, uh, <coughs> this is a very sensitive issue. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, my ambassadors warned me that uh, there's a direct line from here to Washington and from Washington right across the world back to, <laughs> back to Singapore and Malaysia. So what I'm saying now will be monitored almost instantaneously in my, home, in my hometown and in Dr. Mahadev's capital. Uh, I can only repeat what I have said when I was asked this uh, a few weeks ago, that I was shocked when I saw the Deputy Prime Minister appear in court with a blue eye and uh, bruises on his neck, which uh, it was suggested could have been self-inflicted. Uh, the Prime Minister has ordered an inquiry and uh, I hope that the inquiry will show that there was no culpability on the part of the government. That it was not planned or it was not intended in this way. Because if it was, then it was, it's a fundamental change from the kind of Malaysia that I have known. And I am a little disturbed since leaving, uh, leaving home about two weeks ago, but following the news, both uh, via the CNN and internet and uh, email, that there has been a certain change in the chemistry of the people in Malaysia. Uh, for 20, 30 years, it has not known demonstrations in the streets. Yes, there have been protests. Yes, there have been banners. Yes, there have been letters to the press. It's, uh, it's very different from Indonesia. It's got a basis of uh, firm British institutions which they have kept up. And now, in spite of the law saying that you will not demonstrate without a permit, which would have been obeyed in the old days, um, uh, 10,000 men and women gathered in uh, 
the city center after going to a mosque to pray on a Friday. So I, I have a feeling that unless this issue is cleared up and people are satisfied that no grievous wrongdoing was, uh, has been committed, uh, it would be a very troublesome situation because Malaysians have somehow been troubled by what they saw as unacceptable uh, methods of dealing with a deputy prime minister who disagreed with his prime minister. I think we will have to await the outcome of the inquiry and uh, when that when the report is made known, then either the, the dust will settle or there could be more problems. I'm hoping the dust will settle. Mr. Minister, if you will accept this small token of our appreciation for coming and speaking to us, which we're very honored, but if you promise you'll give this to Mrs. Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.